everyone needs a file system or two. Most Linux distros default to either ext4 or ButcherFS, with a scattering of others on things like ZFS and XFS. But these are not the only file systems out there. There is one that has been in development for a very long time that very recently got upstreamed that has a very dedicated fan base. That being bcachefs. Using the tagline, the cow file system for Linux that won't eat your data, as you can tell by the capitals here, we're not referring to the animal. This means copy on write. Another example of these is butterfs and zfs. You've probably heard that snapshots aren't a full backup of your data. The way they work is they only copy the modified data. This saves a lot of space. It is a lot more performant. This is copy on write. Copy on write can mean different things in different contexts, but in the case of a file system, this is how it's being used. Now, bcachefs has some pretty big claims. It claims to be as featureful and have the reliability of things like butterfs and zfs, whilst also having the speed of things like ext4. Now, features are something you can easily go and list out. When it comes to reliability and speed, yes, you can do benchmarks and you can do tests amongst like small groups of users, but to really give those claims any weight, you need wide distro deployment across thousands and thousands of users. And a few updates back, it finally got upstreamed into the Linux kernel after a very, very long time of development. And then, during the 6.11-RC5 cycle, as Linus Torvalds tends to do every so often, he went off on a bit of a rant. A bit of a rant that usually when things like this happen, it's not like a one-off event that causes it. It is something that builds up over time. It is little things here and there, and then eventually, enough is enough. And this is only the first of the emails. So let's talk about how we got here. And to do that, we need to go all the way back to the start to when bcachefs was first announced in 2015. Now, judging by just how many articles Pharonix has made about bcachefs, I think it's fair to say that Michael Larabelle is at least a little bit of a fan, or is at least somewhat interested in seeing where this project goes, because I don't think there is a topic on Pharonix that he has talked about this much, besides just general Linux kernel stuff. Now, way back in 2016, there were questions about whether the project was still going, because the developer was just silently working on it. He wasn't posting about it. He wasn't like, oh, here's what's happening on Twitter. Here's this and that. He was just writing code, making a file system, and doing his job. Which, honestly, I kind of wish that more people did. I feel like a lot more stuff would get done. I'm talking about myself as well. I shouldn't be on social media as much as I am. And whilst it was certainly coming along in 2016, it had a very small user base of very crazy people that wanted to use a very experimental file system that was only at that point a couple of months into development, it wouldn't be for a little bit longer that the first attempt at upstreaming the code base came. That was in 4.18 in 2018. And like many early attempts at trying to upstream code like this, it had some discussion, it had some feedback, there were people that were saying, hey, maybe do this, maybe do this, or try out this instead. For the most part, it was still quite a while away from being ready, but he just wanted some feedback on whether he was going in the right direction, and from what I can see, he basically was. And towards the end of 2018, he gave a status update on the project. What was done, what was close to being done, what was... Still very much a work in progress. It was a fairly extensive status update. The to-do list continues to get shorter and bugs continue to get fixed. It was getting very close to the point where upstreaming was legitimately possible, at least from the developer's perspective. With hopes to possibly upstream the code base sometime in mid-2019. From his perspective, it seemed like things were in a really good state it seemed like the users he had were fairly happy with it, and it seemed like it was becoming at least good enough to be an experimental file system upstreamed into the kernel. There is a lot of code in the kernel that is still a work in progress, but it's good enough to the point where it's not going to cause issues for 
other things in the kernel. But here is the problem. It doesn't matter how long you've been a developer for, how much experience you have with a code base, how much experience you have with a specific kind of work, most people are really bad at estimating timelines, especially when they are completely in control of what goes into that timeline. So whilst maybe if he'd stuck to the absolute minimum set of what he wanted to do, mid-2019 was possible, the next time that started being talked about was the end of 2020. This was being submitted for review in the 5.11 release window. But again, every time you try to do something in a really complex code base, there's always something that you do that isn't done entirely the correct way. And this person here points it out. Please excuse my ignorance if I miss things in other discussions, but if this is what's expected to be reviewed, why the submission is not splitted into reviewable patches. Usually what you would see is instead of one giant block of here's all the code, it would be patch 1, patch 2, patch 3, so on and so forth. As an example, the first time he went up for review. Here we have patch 1 of 2, and then the other one is 2 of 2. This makes it a lot easier to review a specific commit and say, okay, this is what you should change about this one, here's something here, okay, here's something about the other commit, instead of just replying to one mega thread and then trying to work out exactly what things people are trying to refer to. Even with that being the case though, like all the times before it, he got some feedback and then went back to working on things. This time working on faster boot times, doing a core feature rework, and hopefully, maybe, if the review goes well, it could be merged soon. And this time when he submitted it for review, this time he made sure it was split out into separate individual patches. B CacheFest status update, it's done cooking, let's get this sucker merged. This time being a set of 12 separate patches. But this time having a bit of a different problem. This should say I know, not you know. Here is a post from Greg Crower Hartman. You know I reject patches with no changelog text at all. You shouldn't rely on other maintainers being more lax. You need to describe why you're doing this at the very least, as I sure do not know. And this is making a change outside of just the BcacheFS stuff. If he was just changing his stuff, it wouldn't be as big of a deal, but when you're touching things outside of your own work, you need to explain why you're doing that, because that's going to affect other people who now don't know why you're changing it either. So again, got some feedback, went back to working on things. By 2021, it had ButterFS like snapshots. It also had something being called badass snapshots. And again, was time to aim for mainline kernel integration. Surely, 2022 was going to be the year. 2022 was not the year. Surely, 2023 was going to be the year. BcacheFS, a new cow file system. Features, too many to list. Known bugs, too many to list. This time, it has ballooned even Further, now turning into a patch set of 32 patches and turning into the biggest discussion for BcacheFS up to this point. Some of the patches don't have any comments, but some of them have giant threads under them with tons of different people all getting involved to talk about what is being done here. Being such a big patch set and a patch set that a lot of people just hadn't actually reviewed yet before it was a fairly small subset of people there are a lot of issues that were discovered, some old kernel bugs that were being returned, some weird usage of types that don't really make sense in a kernel context, the kernel does things in a very specific way, and just other bugs that maybe didn't get spotted earlier. This is not a problem with BcacheFS. This happens with every single big patch set. There is a lot of things that need to be ironed out to make it Linux kernel ready. Need I say it again, he took the feedback, went back to working, and resubmitted the work for the 6.5 cycle, and that discussion didn't last 6.5, it stretched out into 6.6. And there was a couple of reasons for that. One is it was still an 
absolutely giant patch set. This was not going to change. It touched a lot of systems. It did a lot of things. It just took a really long time to review, leading to a lot of people wanting to give their feedback on the topic. But also, uh, there were a couple of issues with um, getting into fights with people in the thread. But people fighting in a FOSS project, and especially fighting in the LKML, that's pretty normal stuff. It wouldn't be a normal day in Linux if people were not just fighting over random things. Sometimes things that don't matter, sometimes things that actually do have some relevance to the code base, but usually not. And eventually, Linus Horvalds did comment on the thread, because there were some technical issues as well, or more like issues with the developer following kernel development procedure and kind of trying to jump ahead of the queue. No way am I pulling that without a single sign tag and a PGP key with a chain of trust. You've been around for long enough that having such a key shouldn't be a problem for you, so make it happen. There are a few other issues that I have with this, and Christoph did mention a big one. It's not being in Linux Next. Linux Next is basically the testing ground for future mainline kernel patches. You want it to be there so people can go and mess around with things, make sure it all works, make sure the kernel still compiles before you bring it anywhere near a mainline contribution. I don't know why I thought it had been. It's just such an obvious thing for any new I want this merged upstream tree. These kinds of I'll just ignore all basic rules kinds of issues do annoy me. I need to know that you understand that if you actually want this upstream, you need to work with upstream. That very much means not continuing this, I'll just do it my way. You need to show that you can work with others, that you can work within the framework of upstream, and that not every single thread you get into becomes an argument. This, by the way, is not negotiable. If you feel uncomfortable with that basic notion, you'd better just continue doing development outside the main kernel tree for another decade. I know it can scare some people away, I know some people are intimidated by it, but this is why every big project needs a Linus Torvalds. Needs someone who is a fair person, but if somebody is not following procedure, has the power to just say, no, you are going to do this correctly, I don't care how good your code is, I don't care why you think it's such a great addition, if you don't follow procedure, we don't need your code. Now, it'd be very different if he was a new developer that didn't really understand kernel lingo, the way the kernel did things, understandable. But at this point, he's been a kernel developer for a very long time. He should understand the procedure by now. Now, it turns out he did try to submit the code to Linux Next. The issue is it wouldn't build against Linux Next. So it effectively wasn't in the tree anyway. So as you could probably guess, it didn't make its way into 6.6. .6. However, it did move into the Linux Next tree. It was able to build. It did clean up a lot of the external patches, so it wasn't touching as many systems outside of BcacheFS. Anything it needed to touch, those were handled in external patches, and it was getting much, much closer to actually being merged. So once again, it was submitted for 6.7, and this time, it actually got merged. But the merger is not the final destination. This is just the starting line. So come March of 2024, there was some disagreement about some patches that BcacheFS was trying to submit. Kent was approaching this in a very engineer-like mindset, where he wanted to turn a part of the BcacheFS file system into a generic library function that other file systems were able to make use of. Now, doing this within the context of bcachefs, totally fine, no one would really care about it. But when you're trying to do something that is going to interact with other file systems, now it becomes more of an issue. The make random bcachefs code as a library function stuff I looked at decidedly is senseless and ended up meaning that I'm not pulling this without a lot more explanation. And honestly, I don't think the explanations would hold water. Keep it your own code where it belongs. Don't try to make it some generic library thing. And if you do make a library thing, it needs to be much more explained, have much saner naming, 
and fewer disgusting and completely nonsensical interfaces. And no, finding the other file system to share this kind of code is not sufficient to try to claim it's a sane interface and sane naming. But the main deal breaker is the insane math. This was a system that was being very over-engineered. It wasn't being engineered wrong, right? Totally fair how it's being engineered. The problem is, if anyone else needed to touch it in the future, it's like, why did you write it like this? Like, trying to make any modifications to it would be an absolute nightmare. And with that, it brings us to the present. The August patch set, BcacheFS fixes for 6.11-RC5. Now, when we're in the RC period, this is a release candidate. By this point, we are well into the development window, and the general rule for the kernel is development is done before the development window. After the window opens, save it for next time. The only things that are being done are fixing bugs that are showing up for this development period. Not fixing old bugs that you happen to discover in some random bit of code, fixing things that are relevant to new code being submitted. Also, by RC5, things should be pretty much mostly cleaned up. And, um, nobody wants to deal with 1,300 insertions, 671 deletions at this point. Yeah, no. Enough is enough. The last pool was already big. This is too big. It touches non bcachefs stuff. It's not even remotely some kind of regression. At some point, fix something just turns into development, and this is that point. Nobody sane uses bcachefs and expects it to be stable, so every single user is an experimental site. The bcachefs patches have become these kinds of lots of development during the release cycles rather than before it, to the point where I'm starting to regret merging bcachefs. If bcachefs can't work sanely within the normal upstream kernel release schedule, maybe it shouldn't be in the normal upstream kernel. This is getting beyond ridiculous. And Kent disagreed with the framing. Eh? Universal consensus has been that bcachefs is definitely more trustworthy than butterfs in terms of will this file system ever go unrecoverable or lose my data. I've seen many reports of people who've put it through the same situations where butterfs falls. This is the file system you're all going to want to be running, knock on wood, in just a year or two. And Linus chimes back in, I'll believe that when there are major distros that use it and have lots of varied use. But it doesn't even change the issue that you aren't fixing a regression. You are doing a new development to fix some old problem. And now you are literally editing non bcachefs files too. Enough is enough. With Kent saying, what is to be gained by holding back fixes if we've got every reason to believe that the fixes are solid? Again from Linus, what is to be gained by having release rules in a stable development environment? I wonder. But seriously, thinking that I changed a thousand lines, there's no way they introduce new bugs, is the kind of thinking that I do not want to hear from a maintainer. What planet are you from? Stop being obtuse. Now, like most developers on big projects, Kent has a bunch of automated testing. Now, the problem is when you have automated testing, somebody has to write the testing. And sometimes the testing has bugs, and sometimes the testing misses things. <laughs> That's just every code base. Not like, again, not just specific to this code base. Every single code base has this problem. And the bigger the code base, the bigger the problem. Kent, bugs happen. The number of bugs that happen in bug fixes is in fact quite high. You should see the stable tree discussions when people get heated about the regressions introduced by fixes. This is for example why stable has the rule of fixes being small, which does get violated, but it is at least a goal. It cannot be bigger than 100 lines with context, because small fixes are easier to think about, and hopefully they have fewer problems on their own. It is also why my development happens before the merge window rule exists. If you have to do development to fix an old problem, it's for the next merge window exactly because new bugs happen. We want stability. But your pull requests haven't been small fixes. And I admit, 
I've let it slide. You never saw the last pull request when I sighed, did a git fetch, and went through every commit just to see, and then did the pull for real. This time I did the same, and came to the conclusion that no, this was not a series of small fixes anymore. And to be fair to Kent, he does have a solid reply. I know. Look, file system development is as high stakes as it gets. Normal kernel development, you screw up, you crash the system, you lose some work, you reboot, people are annoyed, but generally it's okay. In file system land, you can corrupt data and not find out about it until weeks later or worse. I've got stories to give people literal nightmares. Hell, that stuff has fueled my own nightmares for years. You know how much grey my beard has now, which is why I've spent many years of my life building a code base and development process where I can work productively, where I can not just catch, but recover from pretty much any mistake imaginable, because peace of mind is priceless. Now Torvald did not end up replying to this, and I it's fair, like it's a fair point, right? But at the end of the day, Kent is not the only developer in the kernel, there is thousands of other lines of code, tens of thousands of other lines of code that get dealt with every single patch cycle. And unless there is a good justification for it, as I said earlier, every big project needs a Linus Torvalds, needs someone who can put their foot down and say, this is the way we're doing it. Get over it. Honestly, I love these kernel development stories because it just makes you remember that the people developing Linux are people. They're not development machines. They are people that have their own priorities. Some of them maybe don't follow all the rules. Some of them get a little bit heated. Sometimes people just break character and are like, you know what? I'm done. I'm not going to play the nice guy today. I need to say enough is enough. And honestly, I think it's important for everybody to remember this because it doesn't just apply to Linux, it applies to every other project out there. The people involved in this are people. But let me know your thoughts down below. If you happen to be a kernel developer and happen to have some fun kernel development story, I would love to know. Let me know about it. And if you like the video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, Scribes, Libera Pay, linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and honestly, I kind of want to try out BcashFS to see if it's as good as he says it is.